my presentation will be a little bit more potentially controversial. So uh, I think uh, Clausewitz once said that uh, um, war is an extension of politics by other means. So I'm going to talk about the geopolitics of peak oil and macroeconomics of multiple petrocurrencies. Just uh, very quickly, uh, if you look back over, uh, let's say if you read Michael Clare's book, Resource Wars, you'll notice that there is a correlation between warfare and access to natural resources and the accompanying or subsequent economic effects of this nexus between uh, energy and economics. If you look back over the last 100 years specifically, you'll notice a, an interesting correlation between control of petroleum resources and warfare. I don't have time to uh, explain all those uh, conflicts other than uh, we may disagree with Daniel Juergen's uh, predictions about future oil growth, but I think we should commend him for his historical look at warfare in his uh, Polish Prize winning book, The Prize, where he outlined that the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad was, and as, as long as, as well as uh, William Engel's book, was a uh, contributing factor to the outbreak of War I. Germany and Japan were both driven by their desire to control oil in World War II and the more recent conflicts, uh, and I will speak much more about the Iranian crisis momentarily, but these are all, I believe, have uh, economics and access to natural resources as an underlying factor. I won't speak to this other than this was, uh, I think, what you guys uh, heard yesterday, energy insecurity probably uh, leads to geopolitical instability. Again, this is the basic graph of discoveries versus uh, projected production. Now, this is what I'm going to speak about, is the, the economics of the global economy with respect to the dollar and some emerging trends. As we all know, the dollar uh, has enjoyed its uh, status as a world reserve currency since 1945. Prior to that, the sterling pound was the uh, world reserve currency up until 1920s, 1930s, when the dollar began to encroach upon uh, the British sterling pound status. Um, at the end of World War II, the, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank were established to rebuild Europe and uh, Asia. The dollar is backed by gold, $35 uh, per one ounce of gold. That's where the good as gold uh, idea came from. The system began to unravel between 1968 and 1971 due to the debts of the Vietnam War. Uh, and the United States showed its first ever trade account deficit in 1971. And um, foreign countries began to demand uh, a tremendous amount of gold. They weren't holding their dollars. It was started by uh, uh, France's uh, Charles de Gaulle around 1968, and then the British ended up joining that as well. So in August 1971, the next administration broke the dollar gold link. The Bretton Woods uh, Agreement fell apart, and the United States became a fiat currency for about three years. Between 1971 and 1974, the dollar lost uh, over 30% of its value relative to the German mark. It lost 20% of its value relative to almost every major currency with the exception of sterling pound, whether it be the Japanese yen, the French franc, the Italian lira. There was a dollar crisis in the early 1970s. Um, at that point, OPEC began to consider uh, selling oil in a basket of currencies, which I'll speak to in just a moment. The United States intervened in 1974, Saudi Arabia, and convinced them that they should continue oil pricing in the dollar only and oil transactions in the dollar only, which was agreed to by Saudi in 74, and they got the rest of OPEC to agree to that in 1975. So the dollar sort of became, uh, because of this ironclad agreement, uh, as good as black gold. But this has produced over the last three decades structural imbalances, uh, most notably a, a very large trade account deficit of 805 billion last year and a budget deficit of, of 319 billion. So in the words of, uh, uh, Richard Duncan, the author of uh, The Dollar Crisis, he states that the global economy is in a state of extreme disequilibrium, and I think he's correct. So, because the economy is in a state of extreme disequilibrium, the dollar's status as a world reserve currency is undergoing changes, just like the sterling pounds reserve currency began to undergo changes about 80 years ago. And there are three key variables I think we need to be uh, watching regarding this, uh, these trends. Number one is that central banks may shift their uh, reserves out of dollars, you know, adding euros, adding yen, other Asian currencies. Uh, the, number two, the Asian uh, currencies could begin to end their pegs to the U.S. dollar, which is precisely what China did in July of last year. It would, from 1994 until last July, the, the, the Chinese renminbi was pegged to the dollar. Uh, 
And then uh, they de-pegged it and went to a basket of currencies, including the dollar, but as well as the euro, the yen, and some Asian currencies. And thirdly, and I think most importantly, we could witness a breakdown in the pricing of commodities and dollars as the dollar begins or continues its devaluation. And the most important global traded commodity is, of course, oil and gas. And I put commodity in quotations because the demand for oil is fairly inelastic because of its impact on the global transportation system. So I don't really consider it exactly a normal commodity. And there are five United States carrier, carrier battle groups protecting the oil on the sea, so it's not exactly a normal commodity. And this third item here, this was a crisis when the dollar lost 30% of its value to almost every currency, with the exception of the sterling pound, in early 1970s. And as I spoke to, OPEC began to have some uh, uh, concerns about this. So there were a couple of proposals. One was in 1973 to price oil in a basket of 12 currencies. And then uh, the United States intervened. And then in 1978, OPEC, Kuwait had another proposal. So why don't we do it in three currencies, the German mark, the US dollar, and the Japanese yen. And this is an interesting little uh, internal memo that was once classified uh, that was between the, the uh, Secretary of the Treasury under the Carter administration. We met with Saudi Arabia. And it said, uh, confidence in the dollar remains fragile. Recent and more frequent news reports regarding OPEC's growing disenchantment with use of the dollar for oil pricing further disturbed the market. If OPEC changed the unit of account for oil pricing, it could precipitate a major market reaction, which would be in the interest neither of the Saudis, other OPEC members, nor the US. In this memo, it was also noted that Saudi Arabia wanted to uh, dramatically increase its voting power in the International Monetary Fund. This is 1978. As, uh, as it turns out, Saudi Arabia did kill this proposal within OPEC to sell oil in three currencies. And the quid pro quo, I believe, was they got a 350% increase in voting power within the IMF the following year. They went from 38. And by the way, the voting power in the IMF is sort of a calculation of your GDP. Saudi Arabia went from 38 all the way to number 8, right after the G7 nations. So sort of interesting little history there. Now, that memo and a bunch of other memos were uh, collected by an economist at Cornell, uh, Dr. David Spiro. He spent 15 years researching this and collected all types of documents under FOIA, CIA documents, Treasury documents, first-person interviews in Dubai, Saudi Arabia, New York, Washington. And he wrote a book. It's very obscure, but it's extremely important. It's called The Hidden Hand of American Hegemony, Petrodollar Recycling in International Markets. And in this book, which came out in 1999, the essence is that after the collapse of the Bretton Woods Agreement, the United States used political leverage or coercion, principally with Saudi Arabia, to ensure that oil remained priced in dollars and dollars only and that oil transactions were in dollars and dollars only. And the net effect of all this for the last 32 years or so is that petrodollar recycling, it, it drives international demand slash liquidity value of the dollar. It uh, thereby allows Federal Reserve to effortlessly create domestic credit while exporting our inflation to the rest of the world. And it funds almost half the United States uh, current account deficit currently. It minimizes the currency risk or currency exposure for oil prices or imported oil into the United States vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And it underpins the dollar status as a world reserve currency because, again, oil is the most important commodity in the world. And it's the uh, biggest commodities market. And we're talking a couple of trillion dollars a year in petrodollars that are currently being spent. So. I think the most important effect of petrodollar recycling, aside from the, all the currency risk issues, is, is that we have become very dependent on our, in our country as our manufacturing uh, has been outsourced to cheaper labor markets. The, the Federal Reserve and the Washington policymakers have become more reliant on the petrodollar recycling system to fund the current account deficit. And this is all in Spiro's book, and he makes the point that had OPEC not run high oil prices in the early 1970s, again, late 1990s, it's, it's questionable whether there would have been anyone to fund the current account deficit, which have, has become permanent since 1976. So every once in a while, this is actually exposed. And in, in Business Week, had a, a, a cover article called The New Middle East Oil Boom in March. And uh, Paul Donovan is someone I quote in my book, not this particular quote, but he's a respected global economist at uh, London's um, UBS. And he, 
he calculated that, uh, or he, this is what he wrote, indirectly oil money is bankrolling, U.S. deficit spending, petrodollars mostly channeled through Asia and Europe are funding up to 45% in the U.S. current account deficit. So as I mentioned, the current account deficit is $805 billion, so that means we borrow $2.2 billion a day, every day. Petrodollars are one billion of that. So today, this morning, the United States part received a billion dollar loan from the petrodollar flows and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So this is what, what's going on. So this is very important to, to the Federal Reserve and Washington, Washington policymakers. And this is a, a great understatement that I uncovered in an article that was saying how OPEC had decreased their dollar holdings from 75% to 61%. Uh, and the article went on to say, and it had increased their holdings of euros by the commensurate decrease in dollars. It said a switch away from the oil nexus would be of major strategic and political significance. A senior official of an international economic agency who declined to be identified said this would be considered by the U.S. as unfriendly act. And that is the thesis of my book, Petrodollar Warfare. And uh, those who are familiar with my research, you can sort of can be summarized here. There are only two credible reasons for the invasion of Iraq, control over oil, and preservation of the dollar world reserve currency. Because, if I, if, as we've stated and others have stated, it's crucial to the dollar's dominant role as a reserve currency that dollar pricing of oil should continue. So OPEC has sort of talked about this to the European Union about how, you know, from the European Union's point of view, they would like to minimize their currency risk and have oil priced in their own domestic currency, i.e. the euro. Uh, and OPEC sort of mentioned back in 2002, well, maybe in the long term, um, one question that comes to mind is, could a dual system operate simultaneously? Could oil pricing apply to the Western Hemisphere in dollars and the rest of the world in euros? And they ended this little speech by saying, well, if the dollar, if the euro challenges the dollar in strength, it essentially could be included in the domination of oil bill and a system could emerge it would benefit more countries over the long long term. Now, the European Central Bank uh, chimed in on this a few years ago when Vladimir Putin was meeting with uh, German former Chancellor of Germany, uh, Kurt Hart Schroeder, and Putin was asked, "Will you we consider selling oil in the euros?" And Putin said, "Well, we wouldn't rule that out." And so the next day, they they got they spoke to William Duesenberg, who was the uh, former president and first president of the European Central Bank, is sort of considered the uh, father of the euro. He was asked about his comments by Putin, and he said that would be sensible. He said that uh, Russia should sell its oil to to euros uh, in euros to to the European Union, especially for those countries that are joining the European Union. Here's a, a, a graph that sort of shows the trade account balances. Here's the United States. As you can see, we have a very large trade account uh, deficit relative to the OPEC countries, whereas European Union, by and large, operates a small but positive. In fact, uh, more than half of the imports into the OPEC countries or the Middle East region come from the European Union, whereas the United States is maybe 5%. So the European Union says this makes sense. So I think this is where we are now at this, this little crisis here. This is a, an interesting quote from the current president of Iran, uh, Ahmadinejad, I think I pronounce it. He, he said, we can only blame ourselves promoting economies of the enemies by, and letting them impose pressure on us whenever they wish. Today, a big economic war is underway. The political war is obvious to all, but there is an economic war that goes on undetected. So I thought that's sort of cryptic, but sort of interesting. And, and by the way, the little flags represent United States military bases that have surrounded the periphery of Iran. There's 14 in Iraq, and six in Afghanistan, and central commands here, and we've got bases here air bases in Pakistan, uh, Uzbekistan, Georgia. So there's over 30 United States military bases that have been set up in the last five years that completely circle Iran, so they're probably somewhat paranoid about that. Um, just um, a quick anecdotal comment about their uh, oil production. So we're talking about peak oil. I should just mention that Iran reached peak oil in 1974 at 6.1 million barrels a day. Current production is around 4.3, 4.4 of which they export about two and a half million barrels. The same year, the very same year that Iran reached peak oil, the Shah of Iran, the, f the late former leader, uh, envisioned a time when the world's oil supply had run out, and he declared, and I quote, petroleum is a noble material 
much too valuable to burn, we envision producing as, as soon as possible 23,000 megawatts of electri electricity using nuclear power plants. So he went to the Ford administration, so we want to build 20 nuclear power plants by the year 2000, can you help us? And the Ford administration okayed this plan. In fact, there were a couple of young guys by the name of, uh, just anecdotally speaking, uh, Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, they okayed this entire plan for 20 nuclear power plants. Um, interesting history there. The, uh, just one quick thing, uh, Iran does have, a, regarding the, the weapons of mass destruction or nuclear weapon issue, the, Iran has the largest uranium ore deposits in the Middle East, but they are heavily contaminated with a heavy element called molybdenum. I think I pronounced that correctly, which is sort of like silver, and you cannot enrich uranium uh, above 30 or 40 percent, I think, or at least above 50 percent when it's contaminated with this, so this has to be removed. And the three countries know how to remove this, which is very technically complex, it takes a long time, is the United States, Russia, and China. So Iran sits on a lot of uranium ore, but it's not the right kind because it's too impure for weapons grade fissile material. The molybdenum will, it crashes the cascades, and so you have to remove all that out if you're going to enrich uranium up to 90%. And they don't have the technology or the infrastructure or the know-how to do it because these are nuclear secrets on how to remove this type of uh, material. So just, just so you know. I think what's actually going on here regarding the geopolitical tensions is, is what's going to happen in this building and that the Iranians are optimistic that their international uh, oil, gas, and uh, petroleum bores will allow other companies, or, I'm sorry, other countries opportunity to trade with currencies other than the U.S. dollar. And if you read the Iranian news, they sort of say things like, experts believe that once the Caspian Sea oil producing countries also join Iran's bores, oil, world oil is likely to, I'm sorry, world oil market is likely to experience a revolution. So, why a revolution? Well, what they want to do is sell oil just like London and New York. And there's some misconceptions about people saying, well, Iran's oil exports is only two and a half million barrels a day, it's not that much. So they can sell oil whatever currency they want, but what that's a fundamental misunderstanding of what they're doing. This is an international oil board that's saying Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Maybe Venezuela, do you want to sell oil in the euro? Well, here's your opportunity. So what they have said is they're, the ceiling of this platform will be 25 million barrels a day, which is 10 times Iran's domestic oil production represents 29% of the world's total oil trade. They, as noted, again, this is hardly ever repeated in the United States media, but uh, if you read like foreign media, like this particular article, it says that Iran wants to circumvent the dollar-based oil exchanges to, be, to avoid being impacted by the United States economy. And they also, want to be, they also want to avoid some other things called economic warfare, which I'll speak to in just a moment. Last month, Iran um, had been talking about yours for a long time. And last month, they came out and said, you know, we're going to offer this in three currencies. We're going to offer it in the dollar, the euro, and our own domestic currency called the Real, and there's a little picture of one. I think it's called the Real, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. So they said they're gonna offer in three currencies, and this sort of surprised me uh, because the money supply of the Iranian currency obviously is very, very small, but there are reasons for this. Again, it's the economic warfare that's been taking place since May of this year, unbeknownst to most people. Um, the United States is not able to, to get through the Security uh, Council uh, sanctions, so they're asking other countries to bar financial transactions from taking place in Iran. Uh, Russia is entering the fray with a, a ruble. Is my time almost up? Okay. Russia is entering the fray with a, with their own oil bores, so I have to skip through these. So they're challenging our uh, hegemony, and the Asian monetary trends or the Chinese currency also is. Um, they opened up a, a bores just two months ago in Shanghai. Conclusion is we're going to see a multipolar war, a multipolar world order based on multiple petro currencies, and uh, I think that we will have to uh, look at global monetary reform in addition to oil depletion as issues driving geopolitics. And uh, again, I wish I had a few more minutes, but uh, I'd just leave you with a quote by Albert Einstein: "The significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we're at when we created them." So thank you very much.